You're listening to the Million Acres Podcast. Our mission at Million Acres is to educate and empower investors to make great decisions and achieve real estate investing success. We provide regular content and perspective for everyone, from those just starting out to seasoned pros with decades of experience. At Million Acres, we work every day to help you demystify real estate investing and build real wealth. I'm Deidre Willard, an editor at Million Acres, and thank you so much for tuning in to the Million Acres podcast. Today with me is Cody Sperber of The Clever Investor. You might know him from his popular videos on YouTube, his massive Instagram following, or from his educational series. He's flipped over a thousand houses, and now he really focuses on real estate education, one of my favorite topics. You may have heard his story before, but today we're going to dig really deep into the rags to riches story and how he builds wealth. So welcome, Cody. Thanks for having me. Well, let's get right into it because I want to talk about wholesaling because that's one of the things you teach. It gets such a bad rep in, in the real estate industry. What are the pros and cons of wholesaling? I hear people give it a little bit of a bad rap. I actually fell in love with wholesaling from the moment that I heard about it because to me, getting into real estate or becoming a real estate investor I always thought you needed deep pockets and great connections and a real estate license. And when somebody explained, they actually penciled it out on a napkin for me, this concept of no money down real estate investing, which is wholesaling, uh, it just blew my socks off. I couldn't believe that. I've never heard of this before. I mean, with me being, you know, uh, a young guy that didn't have deep pockets, any connections, no real estate license to be able to get into real estate and make some quick cash was just very, very exciting for me. And I love the wholesaling business because it teaches you how to be a creative real estate investor. In order to be a successful wholesaler, you got to know how to do marketing. You got to know how to talk to people. You got to know how to build rapport. You got to learn a little bit on negotiation. You got to learn your paperwork and master your paperwork. Um, And you got to build connections and relationships in the community because wholesaling essentially at its core is just finding sellers that are looking for an alternate solution than selling traditionally. They need cash. They need it quickly. Uh, Maybe the house is really beat up and it won't qualify for a traditional loan. Maybe they're in some form of distress where they just need money quickly. And when you go and you put out marketing or you get a hold of them and you work out a deal to buy their property, a lot of times when you pay cash, you get a cash discount. And that's kind of the value of paying cash. And when you put their house under contract, even though you haven't purchased it yet, you gain what's called equitable interest in the property. And so you have control of somebody else's real estate, even though you don't own it yet. And that concept blew my mind that I don't need a real estate license because as long as I have equitable interest in a property, the way the law works is you get uh, you get control over it. And the way the contracts are written, I have the right to remarket that property and assign it to somebody else. And those somebody else's typically are landlords or rehabbers. And so being a real estate matchmaker, being able to get in the game and find sellers that need a solution, they they don't want to sell traditionally, work out a deal, put their house under contract, find a landlord looking for a good deal or rehabber looking for a good deal. I'm like, it's a win, win, win. I'm I'm helping everybody in the transaction win. I'm providing a great valuable, uh, a great value for the uh, people involved in the transaction. And I get to make a what they call a wholesale fee or a matchmaker fee for putting the deal together. What other business can you do where you can work for two, three, four hours on a deal and make 10 grand, 12 grand, 30 grand in a couple of hours? I mean, it, it, it changed my life. And yeah, it gets a bad rap because people don't understand it or they think it's illegal or they think it must be a scam or they think... They're just not educated. And I think you it, the more you learn, uh, wholesaling got my foot in the game. Then eventually I wholesaled some deals that I kind of regretted selling. I said, oh, I wish I could have kept those. I wish I would have had the courage or the team to, to buy them and actually take them down and renovate them and then sell them for a bigger profit. Or I wish I would have kept that and put that in my rental portfolio. So I, I kind of think of wholesaling for people that don't have a lot of resources as the gateway to getting into real estate investing, you can make some quick cash, which then will empower you to maybe keep some or buy them and then renovate them and keep a bigger, a, a bigger profit on the deal. So 
I'm a huge fan of wholesaling. You'll never hear me talk bad about it. I teach my students wholesaling. Uh, without it, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. Do you feel, though, that some people underestimate the amount of effort it takes to get started because they see that idea of, oh, I could just, you know, put an offer on a house and flip it really quickly? Yeah, you know, it's it, it really comes down to like anything that you're putting time and energy into. You got to learn the language of real estate in order to be effective at it. Can you get lucky and get a deal right out of the gates on your first few phone calls? Yeah, but that's not the norm. And uh, uh, if you study and you increase your skills and capabilities and you practice your craft, uh, wholesaling's, in my opinion, you know, one of the fastest ways to make money in the real estate business. And whether and I tell people this all the time, if we teach you a skill on how to find the, how to set your business up then find the deals, then analyze the deals, then negotiate the deals, then fill out the paperwork and then find the buyers and play matchmaker and put everything together. And if that takes you one week, one month, or like me, it took me 10 months of trying, didn't get a single deal, overcomplicating everything. Like my brain's so analytical. I was just screwing everything up. I was going in the wrong direction. Every person I talked to had a new opinion of what I should do. And so I was constantly changing directions, got so fatigued that I quit the business. Then four months later, I was, I got a job as a bookkeeper. I was, you know, just got a nine to five type of job. And I got really lucky. I went back to, I got encouraged to go to another seminar, right? I was so burnt out of seminars, but go, come on, man, go to this one more seminar. I promise it'll be different. And I went to that seminar and thank God I went because it changed my life. And I found the missing piece for me, which the reason I wasn't getting deals is because I was out there on my own winging it. The missing piece for me is I met a guy named Lyle and Lyle became my first real estate mentor. And he took me trying to do 30 things and narrowed it down to the two or three things that actually moved the needle. And he kept me on track and he was my accountability partner and he was there whenever I had questions. So I didn't get stuck. He answered the question. He taught me things I couldn't learn in books and I started getting some traction. And then all of a sudden I got my first deal. I made for me personally, and this is not normal. I, I made more on my very first big deal in real estate than I was as a full-time bookkeeper. Wow. How long ago was this? This was like, 2002, 2003, 2003 ish. And uh, it changed my life because all of that hope, all that struggle, all those courses and books and tapes and missing pieces and, and frustration and quitting and then getting back, it all just gelled. Finally, I was like, oh, thank God. I'm, I like, I know, I knew it went from hope to knowing like I could do this again and again. And even though it took me all of those months, like over a year, to put the whole thing together. The distance between deal two and three was only like two months. And then three and four was only like two weeks. And then I started building a pipeline. Then I started getting consistency. And now when I say literally it can happen in hours, I woke up yesterday not having a deal, calling old leads. Me and my team were calling old leads that, you know, they told us no, because really the fortune is in the follow-up. And we called the old leads and one of them picked up and they said, you know what? I'm ready now. That was in the morning. By the time we were done that night, we already had a buyer for it. We locked that deal up. We had a, found a buyer for it, and we're going to make thirty-three grand if everything goes as planned. Hasn't closed yet, but that's on the books. Where else can you do that? How many T-shirts do you got to sell you know, on, on Shopify? Or how many you know stocks do you got to invest in to get thirty-three grand just kind of out of hustling? And so. Uh, is it going to happen like that for everybody? No, but I do I do believe that it will not happen at all if you don't get yourself in the game. And you have to be willing to pick up the phone, which I think is something that a lot of people uh, maybe don't feel comfortable with at first. I didn't. You want to hear a crazy story? Mm -hmm. it, this, is, this is Cody Sperber, analytical. My biggest self-limiting beliefs was that no, I looked young. I looked like I was 10 years old, like trying to go flip a house. Like people were, who's going to take me seriously? I have no money. I drive a piece of crap Nissan pickup truck. Like who's going to think that I'm going to pay cash for their house? And that translated to everything I did. I believed that internally, that I sounded young. I looked young. That was my fear. So I hesitated getting on the phones. And Lyle, my mentor, knew that I was lying to him, telling him that I was making my calls when I wasn't making my calls. And finally, one day, he said, you know what, Cody, enough's enough. And we had this three-strike rule with me. Like it, I had, He took me on as a student as long as it was like baseball. I had three strikes. Once the third strike happened, 
I'm done. So I already had one strike against me and I was working on my second. And so he was like, I know you're lying about your calls. Here's an address. Meet me here at midnight tonight. <laughs> and I was like, what are you crazy? And he goes, bring your call scripts. Meet me here at midnight tonight. And I'm like, so you're going to be there at midnight? And he goes, just meet me there at midnight. I show up at this address at midnight and it's a cemetery and it's the middle of the night. And guess who doesn't come? Lyle doesn't show. 30 minutes later, he calls me. He goes, you there? I said, yeah, I'm here. And he goes, I said, are you coming? Like, I'm sitting here waiting for you. This, what are you doing? And he goes, get out your call scripts, walk into the middle of the cemetery. We're going to role play. <laughs> and he role played with me for about 35 minutes in the middle of the cemetery. And at the end of it, I finally just started shaking my head. I was like, I, I, I understand what you're doing now, Lyle. And he goes, Cody, listen to me. You're the only thing in your way. You will be super successful if you can just knock that BS self-limiting belief right out of your head that people aren't going to take you seriously. If you can do this in the scariest place in the middle of the night, you could do this in your dress pajamas in the comfort of your own home. Stop getting in your own way and start making your dang calls. And I was like, I get it. Yeah, he's right. Like, I can't believe I've been overcomplicating this. And as I was leaving there, he said, by the way, look at all those people there. They've all slid into their graves. Some of them lived life to the fullest and some of them live life with re regrets. You got to pick and choose which way you're going to live. And I went home that day and I woke up the next morning. I said, you know what? I'll never not pick up the phone again and make my calls. And I started getting really good at the calls. And now it's my favorite thing to do in the business. I love talking to people. I love working the leads. And uh, uh, I share that with you because it seems complicated. It felt like that phone was 10,000 pounds. When people would call I would or answer, I would hang up quickly because of my fear. But once you get through it, it's game on. And that's how you do deals. You need to do two things in this business to make it rain. One, get on the phone and talk to people. Two, get out and actually go to the real estate and make some dang offers. You do those two things and you have a very good chance of becoming very successful in the real estate business. Awesome. I love that story. So you're also now part of this whole kind of real estate influencer culture thing, and which is kind of growing by leaps and bounds. Do you feel that every investor who kind of wants to make a name for themselves has to build a personal brand and or a real estate brand? Is that kind of part of the world we live in now? I feel like it'll help. Yeah. I feel like we no longer give out uh, business cards. I think Instagram's your business card right? Facebook's your business card. You know, unfortunately, we, unfortunately, we live in a world where clout and your following and your brand and your impact makes a big difference in the way people view you, especially when they're first meeting you. And it's worth the investment. I do think that people that build a strong personal brand make more money. I think people with a strong personal brand have more doors open for them. I think people that take the time to learn to build their brand have a uh, a better chance of getting to a yes. So I encourage it. And guess what? Here's the good news. I don't have any background in building a brand. I just took a platform like Instagram and I studied it and I realized Instagram's a hackable platform. There's a, a, a process for growing a following on there. And once I realized the process, I just rinsed and repeated like all marketing channels, you got to lean in on it. I didn't do 10 platforms at one time. I did Instagram and I put all my love and energy into Instagram and I grew that platform first. And I spent 90 days just putting lots of love and energy into the posts that I was putting. And I would write these really long detailed captions and I became a content curator and I would find and follow accounts that I really admired. And I would take the best, most, um, uh, the best post that had the most engagement and I would take, why did that one get a ton of engagement, but the next three didn't? And I would take the ones that had a lot of engagement. I would spin that messaging and, and make it my own and put it on, onto my page. And guess what? It worked. So I was allowing other pages to kind of do all the research and development for me. And then I would take their best post, spin it and make it my own. And I just, I did that for 90 days straight. I posted six, seven times a day. It was a ton of work, but all of a sudden I started getting traction. And until you get your actual page cleaned up, nobody's going to follow you, right? Nobody's going to engage with you if, if you don't have anything good to say or, or to share. And then once I had that dialed in, I realized that there's a whole world of people out there that have big pages that will post your content on their page and send you traffic. Building a personal brand is not very difficult. It's just a, a system is what I'm trying to share with you guys. 
And once I did that, it was just rinse and repeat over a long period of time. The challenge with most entrepreneurs is they're not consistent enough. And I stayed consistent. And all of a sudden, I, you know, I went from no followers to, you know, a thousand to five thousand to ten thousand. Now I got one point two million followers on Instagram. And that opened, I got the blue check mark out of nowhere one day. And next thing you know, the doors started opening and people started treating me like, hey, will you come on my podcast? And will you will you come speak at my event? And even though I was scared and I was hesitant and I didn't know everything, you know, it was new to me. I put myself out there and I I started showing up and I you know, started getting pretty good at, at at sharing the message. And now here we are a decade later, people know me as a clever investor, but I would have been, no, nobody would have known my name if I wouldn't have built the personal brand to start. Really good point. And I think that consistency thing is interesting. I used to teach social media to real estate agents and getting them to be consistent about it was, was job one. And the ones that did are just some of the, you know, some of the most successful real estate agents ever just because they they just got into doing it every day. Yeah. Which actually brings me to the next point. I want to talk a little bit about Clubhouse because a Clubhouse has kind of come out of nowhere. One of the things I've noticed in social media and real estate is that real estate agents, real estate investors, everyone, when there's a new platform, they all kind of jump in. But I'm starting to hear that, hear that uh, deals are being done on Clubhouse. Are you seeing that? Yeah, I mean... The challenge with Clubhouse specifically is it takes a considerable amount of your time and it's very difficult to be productive throughout your day if you're spending six to eight hours on Clubhouse. So that's the trade-off. So I think I love the platform. I love audio only. I love seeing all my real estate friends on there and I think it's really helping a lot of people. It, it's becoming like almost like a coaching platform more than anything else. So uh, I think some great networking is going on there. There's a, a guy uh, named William that's really using it. He's a real estate agent. He does the real estate networking happy hour every day. And he normally has 100 to 200 people on. And I love his consistency. They're all agents. You know, they're all hanging out. And I think that if you uh, are worried about COVID or going out or, you know, it's a great alternative to, to not being able to network in person. I was on there quite a bit in the beginning. I've slowly stepped back just because of the the benefit and the time involved wasn't there for me other than for my coaching business. That it worked really well for my coaching business, but generating real estate leads themselves uh it wasn't there. But I will say this. Because of Clubhouse, I met a lady named Vina on Clubhouse who Ended up speaking at one of my live events and then did a tour to all my rehabs. I got, you know, 10, 15 rehabs going at any one time. And she did a tour of my rehabs. She's exiting a bunch of big multifamily. She's sitting on a ton of capital. And she's now injecting a lot of money into the business as a, uh, as a lender. So, you know, the connections are out there. It's really doesn't matter what the platform is. It's what you do with it and how much love and energy you put into those relationships that really makes the biggest difference. Interesting. Yeah, I guess it's really about that consistency. And I think you made a really good point, too. I think a lot of people think they have to be on all the platforms at once where, you know, what you talked about earlier with Instagram is that idea of diving in and really making the connections in one place. Yeah, it's it. Entrepreneurs, we have a curse. It's dying a death by a thousand cuts. And we think we could do it all. We're superhumans, right? We're going to we're going to dominate all the platforms. The ones, if I was to put them in order, I would say uh, podcasts or YouTube would be at the front of my funnel, meaning those are the most, the, the best engaged followers to have. And at the back would be like, uh, like uh, Instagram or something like that, because Instagram people like, unlike, follow, unfollow, like they're in and out of your world constantly. But you get a YouTube subscriber, you get a podcast subscriber, and they they are in it to win it. They very rarely unsubscribe, and they go down the rabbit hole. They fall in love with you. And uh, so if I was in the real estate space to do it all over again, I think guys like Chris Crone and some of those guys that are really just pumping out video after video after video on YouTube and then making the YouTube video, making video core competency, and then taking that video content, using VAs to cut and slice and dice it, and syndicate that content to all the other platforms. So he really only focuses on one. His team pushes the content out to everything else. 
and it's like a little automated process and, and he uses all VAs. And I, I think he, out of everybody is doing it the best. Interesting. Okay. So VAs, virtual assistants, how important are they for you in your business? And do you think that's something that real estate investors should take advantage of? I think um, we use them uh, quite often for all kinds of different roles. I think anything that needs to be uh, like data or uh, anything that needs to be repeated over and over and over again, VAs are great for, um, uh, depending on how deep you want to go in this conversation. So we, we, I've tried using VAs for all kinds of aspects of the business. The ones that I've found the most success is admin and social media and content syndication and that kind of thing. I also use really good English speaking VAs for processing our first round of phone calls. So we use a lot of like call center VAs uh, to basically take our calls, free screen them, and then put them into our CRM and then tee us up and set the appointments for us. If I was new, I think I would focus on mastering the craft first myself so I could create the standard operating procedures and understand the business well enough because the number one failure most investors make with a VA is they say to themselves, I have a job or I'm very busy. I don't have time to deal with that. So I'm just going to hire somebody and they're going to deal with it. But because they've never done it, they don't know how to manage them properly. So there's a big disconnect between the investor's expectations and what the VA is capable of doing. And unless you train, just like any team member, unless you train them really well or empower them with standard operating procedures and say, all right, VA, here's a document. At the top is a little screencast video that I made of me doing the activity. Then below it is the written out step-by-step -step process of the activity. I'm handing you this SOP, this document. Go through it, do it. We're going to review it together. And then if you have any questions, we'll course adjust. And then from that point forward, you are now responsible for this activity within my business. And you're going to report. We're going to meet every day on Zoom for five or 10 minutes. And you're going to give me a report of what you're doing that day. And we're just going to, I'm going to manage you correctly. You do that. I love VAs. You're not willing to do that. I think you're going to find that you're going to be let down. The VAs won't do what they're supposed to do because they can't. They're not empowered. And you're going to lose a bunch of money. Well, I really like what you said there. I think it's an analogy sort of like when you're painting, right? You have to tape everything up and it takes a long time and it's really annoying to to do that before you before you paint a room. But the same thing, you get a better result if you if you put in that time in the preparation, then that's really what you're talking about here. Exactly. And you also mentioned another important thing is the CRM. So I think a lot of real estate investors don't really know why they need a CRM if they, they don't really consider themselves to be a salesperson. But having a CRM, having a database is, is I think, is very important. And it sounds like that's been your experience too. Yeah. I mean, 15% of your deals you're going to get immediately. 85% of your deals are going to get done through follow-up. And a, a good CRM to me is all about speed and automation and uh, an organization. And so for me, when you're by yourself, can you run off of a yellow legal pad and a bunch of file folders all over your desk? Maybe, right? Is that the most effective and efficient? Absolutely not. As you start adding team members or, you know, you are working with, you know, real estate agents or lenders or vendors, or if you're trying to grow your team and have multiple team members in working on deals together, you have to have a CRM. And they're so cheap nowadays and so effective. I used to have to, back in the day, have one system for email. It was over here. It has username and login. And one system for this, you know, for the, for the organization. And that had a username and login. And I had like 13 systems all patchworked together. Now they're all in one. Most CRMs have everything all in one. And it, what it does is it allows me to create some automated follow-up campaigns, whether it's email sequ drip sequences or direct mail sequences. So when a lead comes in and I put it in the CRM, I can just create a tag and tag it and say, go. And the system will send out three emails over a certain period of time and two postcards. And now I'm done. I'm, I'm mentally checked out. Now, at least if I know most of my deals are going to happen through follow-up, I either need to be really good at follow-up and really organized, or I need to automate it. And as long as you do that and use the tool effectively, I think, why would you not want a CRM? Now it's virtual. I can run it from anywhere, from my cell phone or laptop and a Wi-Fi signal. So I could do deals on the beach. I could do deals in the boardroom.
<laughs> I think everybody loves that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about negotiation, because I know that's a class you teach. I feel like it's a core skill that a lot of investors don't really kind of, they don't focus on, they don't know that they need it. And it's something that's a little bit, I think, kind of hard to teach, because the only way you can kind of really do it is through role playing, which you mentioned earlier. So how do you, how are you teaching negotiation? Yeah. So, uh, well, first off, I don't teach negotiation when you first start. Okay. Cause I think what happens is everybody wants to get real technical and they want to be a negotiation ninja and it takes them out of their authentic true self. I tell everybody who's new in the beginning, you only have to do two things to be successful in this business when it comes to influence or getting sellers to buyers or somebody to say yes to you, you got to be authentic and you got to be enthusiastic. And as long as you show up with those two things, right, and, and it helps to know your craft, it helps to know the language, right? You can't show up with no clue on what's going on, so study. But do you need to know how to have the perfect objection-blocking strategy? Do you need to have the perfect phrase or language pattern, neuro-linguistic programming strategy? No, you don't. You show up with too much. This is like if you, if you do a, a study on like take used car salesmen, their first month or two, they normally do really good. And then they fall off like a, this sales cliff because they start, oh, I'm, I'm kind of good. I got I to gotta have some skills now. And when they roll up, they don't roll up as authentic. They roll up kind of, you know, with strategy. And next thing you know, people's guard goes up and they feel, man, this person's trying to sell me something. That doesn't feel good, right? I want you to enroll me into the deal. I want you to influence me because of collaboration and bridging the gap and making me feel like I'm heard through active listening and stuff. And so just be authentic and enthusiastic. Uh, once they get past a few deals though, now it's time to start to sharpen the skills a little bit and just say, okay, here's some core things that we have to get down. Number one, nobody's going to do a deal with you if they don't know, like, and trust you. So it's all about rapport building. And rapport building is all about asking the right questions. It's not about dominating the conversation or leading them someplace. It's just pulling the information out in a way where you do less talking, they do way more talking. And so we we actually have, a. I almost want to pull the camera and go show you. We actually have right on the other side of my studio right now, 20 students going through an influence negotiation class. And it's a two-day class where we take them through rapport building, objection blocking. Um, we, we show them, we ha help them master their phone skills, their in-person negotiation skills, like, like how to use their physiology. You know, every single person has to, in, when we teach them, they have to put a mirror next to their phone. So when they're doing their phone calls, they can see what they look like. Only 7% of communications through words, 55% through physiology. So if they're not looking the, you know, it's like a lot of people are hunched over their computer, typing in, making their calls, or they're on the go, and they're trying to do phone calls while they're going through the grocery checkout line. How can I be present in a conversation and hear you and feel your emotion? It's not about what you're saying. It's about what emotion you're feeling. How do I identify your love language? How do I identify your personality type? I can't do that unless I'm present in a conversation and I'm paying attention to those things. So we teach them personality types. We go over love languages. We go over what and how questions. We go over where they sit, how they sit, what they need to look like, how they smile through their eyes and their teeth and, you know, have conversations powerfully instead of, uh, and also posturing. We talk about, look, you're not desperate for a deal. That's not how this thing works. Does a bank want to lend you money when you're desperate for money? No, right? They want to give you money when you don't need the money, right? And that's just the way the world works. And so take those lessons. We, 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 it takes a long time to get good at, at, at influence and negotiation, but take some core fundamental things, internalize them, make them your own. And, uh, I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but I think it's goes back to one of the core skills you need as a real estate investor or agent. You need to know how to talk to people and you know how to make offers. Both of those involve influence, persuasion, and negotiation. I love that. And you just mentioned financing, which is interesting to me because I feel like that's a place where people, beginning investors get really stuck about raising money either from friends and family or going to a bank. How do you teach investors, beginning investors to, to get started in financing? Well, this kind of goes back to wholesaling. 
You know, for me, if, if you don't have the resources or the connections or the financial friends and you don't come from money, a great gateway to get in the business is wholesaling. It'll get you some dough, uh, some money coming your way. It'll get you some quick wins. It'll teach you the language. It'll get you in the game. As you're going through it, okay, you want to start to uh, identify people that you're networking with or friends or family or financial friends that have the potential to potentially invest, that have money that it lazy, we call it lazy money. That's not being used correctly. It's just sitting mattress money. It's sitting in a CD. It's not earning good interest rates because the way we teach it is, look, you're not going to go around all your friends and family and ask to borrow money. You're also not going to roll up into a bank and say, just give me money because especially with the way the financial markets are right now, like it's very difficult as an, for an entrepreneur to get a loan under any situation and it's getting tougher by the day. So we got to kind of go away from the banks and go back to our financial friends, but nobody's going to lend you money if you're desperate. Nobody's going to lend you money if you go borrow or ask to borrow or beg for money. So the posturing is get some credibility, right? Get, get some wins, start identifying those financial friends around and start talking to them and say, look, look at what I'm doing over here. I'm, I, I'm marketing like a champion. I'm, I'm studying my craft. I'm mastering it. I'm becoming really great. And all these amazing off-market opportunities are coming my way. Right now, I'm not empowered to actually take them down and, and do them, but I want to. And the reason people sell me houses at a discount is because I move quickly. And so speed is really important. So right now, you have your money over here. Well, let me show you two ways that if I bring you an opportunity to invest in one of these two programs, if I, if I give you this opportunity and you like one of the two, I just need to know that if in the future when one of those situations arises and I come to you and present you the opportunity of either, hey, you can lend me 100000 or 200000 that's secured by real estate. It's going to be secured by a first trustee position. You're going to get 12% on your money. It's guaranteed. Whatever that conversation is, that's program one. And or We'll do a partnership program where you put the money into the deal. I find the deal. I'll give you 60% of the profits. I'll keep 40. I'll do 100% of the work. Your money's secured by the real estate. I never touch it. It just goes right into the deal through escrow. But we're partners in the deal. And if I bring you these two, uh, a, 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 a property that I'm buying at a big discount, and I say, which of these opportunities works best for you? And you pick one. I just need a firm yes or a firm no quickly because that's how I'm able to get these quick uh, at such a discount. You go around and you plant that seed with five or six or 10 people. Now, when you get that home run, now you're going to cherry pick it out. Okay. And you're going to go to your financial friend. You're going to say, I got it. Here it is. They say, yes. Now you got the money. So the financing, good deals sell themselves. Good deals finance themselves. It's up to you as the creative real estate investor to have all the business pieces around it because you should treat their money way more important than you treat your own. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but you need to respect their money more than you would respect it if it was your own. That means your contractors have to be on point. They have to be vetted. They have to be good. Your team members, your closing agents, your real estate agent, everything has to be dialed in and on point. So if you're not there yet and you're listening to this, you got some work to do. Start putting the pieces of the puzzle together so that way when you go to your financial friend and say, I got this opportunity, it's go time, and you get the yes, now you can take full advantage of it. And, and once you get some case studies, you're never going to have a problem raising money again. People now throw money at me. I have more money than I have deal flow. Back in the day, I had more deals than money. And so uh, last little hack, by the way, what I did for me personally while I was trying to uh, get credibility, I started building a credibility book. And that credibility book had my wholesale deals in it, but it also, I like let's say I want to do deals in 85018, the zip code in Phoenix, Arizona, that's the hottest zip code. And I'm like, I want to do deals in 85018. I'm going to go onto the MLS. I'm going to find deals that have recently sold that are fully renovated. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to print out that MLS listing. And I'm going to go into the tax records and research what it was purchased for. So it was purchased for 500. It sold for 1.3, fully renovated. And I'm going to start to build a little case study. Even if it wasn't my deal, I'm going to be able to show examples. Look, this is where I'm marketing. 
These are the types of deals that I want to do. When we when I find one, I need a firm yes or a firm no from you. So even though they weren't my deals, they were example deals. And that helped me sell the vision of what I was trying to do. And the last hack I'll give you is leverage your mentor's credibility. I leveraged Lyle's credibility because I didn't have any. Right? My mentor has done hundreds and hundreds of deals. My mentor is a real estate millionaire. My mentor is involved in this deal with me. Oh, okay. Well, if Lyle's involved, I'll do it. Right. And so until I got my own credibility and my own uh, uh, brag book finalized, that's what I did. I love it. That's so great. Uh, respecting people's money is crucial. Well, that's a great place to take a short break. Like what you're hearing? Get more real estate investing news and advice from Million Acres on Instagram at Million Acres and on Twitter at Million Acres underscore co. During our break today, we are excited to have Million Acres Lead Investment Analyst Matt Argersinger here to speak briefly about one of our newest services, Real Estate Winners. Thank you for joining us, Matt. Thanks for having me. So what is Real Estate Winners and who is it for? Well, I like to think of Real Estate Winners as our answer to stock advisor in the real estate market. It is a service that provides recommendations on publicly traded real estate investment trusts and real estate companies. So it's a pretty big universe out there. There's over 200 REITs to choose from and, and probably dozens, if not hundreds of real estate companies are in our universe. And we provide regular investment recommendations as well as commentary on the market, educational material. And it's really designed to get anyone who's interested in investing and learning about real estate uh, started. So is it geared toward new investors or is it more for seasoned pros? I think real estate winners can serve both. I think if you're a new investor, maybe you're just getting started with stocks and, you're, and you want to learn more about how to add real estate to your portfolio, great place to start. If you're a seasoned investor and just thinking, okay, how can I diverse my portfolio, maybe reduce the volatility in my portfolio, maybe add some income to my portfolio, then I think Real Estate Winners is a great solution for that cohort as well. Fantastic. What are the benefits of being a member of Real Estate Winners? Number one benefit is day one when you join, you get our top 10 investment ideas at the moment. So really right from the beginning, you know what our 10 best ideas in the publicly traded real estate market are. And then going forward on a monthly basis, you'll get a new recommendation, sometimes more than one new recommendation, as well as regular content that we're coming out. We're covering our past recommendations, providing updates and talking about the uh, real estate market. So it's, it's really the full package. Perfect. So what do you need to get started? Really all you need is a, a discount brokerage account. So if you're used to buying stocks and you might, you probably already have that, if you haven't bought stocks in the past, of course, just uh, open a discount brokerage account. These days, you don't even have to pay commissions. It's fantastic. So it really couldn't be easier to get started investing uh, with real estate winners. Sounds fantastic. So how can people sign up? Sure. They can head over to real.fool.com. That's R-E-A-L dot fool dot com. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. All right. I am back with Cody Sperber of Clever Investor, and we're talking real estate. We're talking brand building, empire building. I saw you sold a luxury property early last year. What is happening in Phoenix right now? Super, super low inventory, outrageous demand. Everybody from everybody, a lot of people from California are moving over here. It is the hottest market in the United States. And, uh, the luxury market, believe it or not, is booming because there, there is just no inventory. It is, I think we have less than a month's worth of inventory on the market right now. Very, very low active listings. Uh, properties are selling before they're finished being built or remodeled. There are, uh, you know, crazy stuff going on. Uh, every offer we have on one of our completed rehabs has appraisal waivers, has multiple offers, you know, no contingencies, earnest deposits go hard immediately. They're, I'll, I'll pay a guaranteed 25000 above list. Like, it's nuts. I haven't seen it like this since 2005, 6, and 7, which probably isn't a good thing. But yeah, makes makes me a little worried when you say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I don't think it's going to fall off a cliff like it did. I, I just don't see that happening. You know, uh, no, none of us have a crystal ball, but the met the the uh, foundation is different, right? It, it's not the same over leveraged people that couldn't afford a mortgage, but they you know did like a a no doc type of loan. 
it really is, a, there's a tremendous amount of equity trapped into the real estate right now, and it's just a, a supply and demand imbalance. And so we're building a lot of, right now, my bread and butter kind of focus is that not super high in luxury, but that mid range where I buy for 600,000, I tear the house down, I build a 39, uh, between a 3,800 to a 4,200 square foot house. Uh, and I back at the back end is anywhere between 1.3 to 1.6, um, maybe 1.7. And that's kind of the model that's just crushing right now. We have a couple of them going, we're, we're bringing in about 400 K when it's all said and done. And you know, it's those houses sell before they're done. Well, that's really interesting because it's, it's kind of a different world from doing your mid-market flip to doing a luxury flip, even if it's not at the highest end. And I know sometimes, you know, you see in the media stories about luxury flips gone wrong and things like that. What things do you keep in mind when you're doing these types of renovations? Well, you know, we're, we're licensed contractors. We own a development company. And so uh, we, we, we really focus on specific zip codes. We don't, the, for those types of deals, we're not, we're only playing in like two or three zip codes and they have like less than one week on market days on market. In most cases, like I said, they fly off the shelf as soon as they're built. Uh, uh, the, the neighborhood's a little bit older, you know, it, built in the fifties and sixties. Uh, so as you drive down the neighborhood, there's a beautiful new house, a beautiful new house, ugly old house, ugly old house, beautiful new house, beautiful new house, ugly old. So it's really over the last few years, a lot of developers have gone in and remodeled. It's called Ar Arcadia, if you guys want to look it up, but it's, it's the border of Phoenix and Scottsdale, which are two, you know, very high demand areas for, you know, young families on the come up. And, uh, my, we have a kind of a, we have an in-house designer we have a uh, architect we work with and it's really just you know more about finding the right house at the right price everybody wants to try and sell you a property at 800 900,000 we really need to be around the 600 to 700 at the max buy price in order to make it work so my guys are out there door knocking every single day we're sending postcards every single day we're texting and calling every single day just trying to get out and meet those homeowners and we offer them one of two things. We say, look, we can buy you know, your property and just cash you out, or we could do what's called a price lift, which is basically you donate the house, we'll build it and, or renovate it or build the house, depending on what we're going to do with it. And uh, it's kind of almost like a partnership program with the homeowner. And we've been pretty successful with getting people to buy into that. Now that Green Elephant Development has done dozens of these, we have a great brag book that we show up with and just say, Hey, look, this is our development company. And this is, this is what we can do. And this is what the end product looks like. Do you want to partner or do you want to sell? And that's kind of our pitch to the seller. And yeah, we're vendors. So we kind of went upstream to get better pricing on flooring, on cabinetry, on uh, stone and, you know, any whenever you're building, it's all about saving money on the materials. That's the biggest thing that's ballooning out of control right now. Price of lumber has skyrocketed. Everything's just out of control. And so, you know, we kind of asked ourselves a question one day, like, who provides the materials to Home Depot? Right? How, you know, I can go to Home Depot and buy, or I can go to the people that supply to Home Depot. And so we started moving up the stream and uh, became vendors for a couple different companies. And while it costs us a little bit to get some of this stuff because we buy in bulk, we use it in a lot of our properties because as we started to scale, we can use the same fans, we can use the same cabinetry, we can use the same doors and hardware and stuff like that, uh, which brings the cost down. Right. And you've sort of developed a, a template for success of what the end user, the buyer is going to be looking for too, I'm sure. And the in-house designer keeps us on point. You know, that really mm -hmm. was a big investment for us, but it paid off because uh, now us as builders and developers, we're not out picking tile colors and flooring <laughs> and trying to match everything. We allow the designers to do the design work and, uh, we're, we're more focused on just the building process. Well, and it's interesting to me too, because 
do you feel that you're in competition with some of the iBuyers out there? I know Zillow and Open Door have been big in Phoenix. Is that something that that worries you that they're just that people are just going to take that that kind of quick money? Um, they definitely made a dent in the and trying to actually shifted the way we do business. Now there are certain criteria that the iBuyers will buy and certain ones that they won't. So if if you're worried about the competition, True. just research what they do and don't and do what they don't. Um, so that that's one strategy and that's what we started. Um, honestly, we're at a point now where we're one of the larger wholesale operations in the Valley. We're also one of the larger developers in the Valley. Like that, you know, I, at any one point in time, we got, you know, between 10 and 20 rehabs going and we're spec building all these, you know, luxury houses. And so we have sort of become an eye buyer from the aspect of there's uh, companies like Home Light that come to us and and we buy leads off of Home Light. We're one of their largest iBuyers. Um, and we sell to the iBuyers. We source so many deals that when we pass, we actually uh, connect with our uh, friends over at OfferPad or Open Door and we pass the deals on to them and we're able to sell to the iBuyers. So it's it is what it is. You can't stop it. You got to work with it. Now, my pitch is different than the iBuyers, right? And that's really, as a marketer, I had to understand their model so I know how to present mine differently as an alternative. Hey, you can go to the iBuyer and you can sell to them and they're going to take this approach or you can come with us. And with me, I'm way more creative. I'm more, way more flexible. They can give you a cash offer. They can buy your property. They can put a moving van out front and you're off down the road. I could take over your payments. I could put cash in your pocket immediately. We can work out a deal where you become my partner. Like I could give you cash. Like there's all, I, I show up and there's four or five options for the homeowner. They show up, there's one. So the creative, I tell people all the time, you'll never have a money problem in this business. You'll have a creativity problem. And that's really what it comes down to. My mentor Lyle taught me to be a creative real estate investor wraparound mortgages, subject to seller carrybacks, you know, all inclusive contract for deeds, lease options, sandwich lease options. When I show up, there's nothing the seller's going to tell me that I don't have a solution for. I have like 10 tools, right? The iBuyer has one. So I guess now it's just a game of who can get there first? That that is a brilliant pivot. That is that is just fantastic. So you've built this team now. You you know you started off by yourself, as you explained in the beginning. Now you've got this big team. What do you look for in an employee? How do you how do you find out who's going to be the right partner long term? I think it depends on the position. Most businesses know what they do. Most know how they do it. Most know why they do it. The thing that I focus on, and as I scale high-performing teams and, and put them together and get them to really kick butt, is the what's in it for the team member if they do it alongside with me. And I think that's the piece that I nerd out on the most because I can take an average person and put them in a, a position and they can light up and become superhuman if we're in alignment because alignment equals velocity. And if I can't get in alignment with the person, then, and, and I haven't taken the time to get to know their wants, their needs, their fears, their, their, their hopes, their dreams, all that stuff, then we can't get in alignment and I'm never going to get the most out of them. And vice versa, they're not going to ever feel like they're getting the most out of the company. And so that's where I spend the most. How do I take an entrepreneur, which most of us are, and I'm the entrepreneur, right? I got this huge vision of where we're going. You're an entrepreneur. You got a vision of where you're going. Can I fit your vision within mine? And if I can get that alignment, then, and I feel like you have heart and integrity, I can train you technically to do anything, right? I can make you a beast on the phones. I can make you great at the rehabbing process or the build process. Uh, you can become a great negotiator. All of that's just technical skills. That's the easy part of the real estate business. I can't change whether you're a bad person, a hard worker, whether you have good intentions, whether you do the right thing, even when nobody else is looking. You know, those, those are all skills that you come to the table with. You either have or you don't. And I found that you can take somebody that has lots of great things about them, put them in the wrong seat, and they're going to fail miserably. They're going to suck. And that relationship's never going to work. You can also just move them over to the right seat, get in alignment with them. They light up and you think that, 
how will I ever do it without them now? I have to have them in my world. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I, I, people see me now with the millions of followers and, you know, I have over a hundred team members between my businesses and my brands. And I would never in a million years be here. I'm not here because I'm this great entrepreneur that has everything figured out. I'm here because all these amazing people locked arms with me and helped me become the person that I am. I'm like the swan on the top of the water looking all majestic and they're down there paddling like maniacs, right? And so I'm just like, oh, thank God I have this amazing team of people supporting me and this vision that we have together. Uh, and it really is changing all of our lives. There's so much money in the real estate business. We're all sharing in it. And that's, that's my favorite part is that I went from being a broke bookkeeper going down that path to becoming this, you know, person that's in this power position to change lives generationally for all of us. It's the greatest feeling in the world. Mm. Oh, that's just brilliant. I love it. So one last question for you. Um, I noticed that you wrote a book on crypto way back in, in 2018. So, you know, congratulations on being ahead of the curve. Now we've got Bitcoin all over the place. We've got NFTs. We've got, you know, we keep hearing about how blockchain is going to change title. What are you thinking about all of that right now? Buy more crypto. Buy, well, buy more Bitcoin. <laughs> buy more Bitcoin. That's what I think about that. I think, I, look, I think a certain amount of your money needs to be very conservative, right? And I think some of your investments need to be kind of a swing for the fence. Go for it, right? And Bitcoin is one of those things that, in my opinion, because of its scarcity and uh, it's because of the youthful energy that's around it, I think that it's going to continue to grow. And it's one of those things that I would I put my life savings into it and just like pray? No, but would I put a portion of my money into it and uh, kind of do a swing for the fence type of thing? I think it's going to go up considerably personally. And uh, I think the more the government just prints money and devalues our dollar, more people are going to look for alternatives like cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. And uh, it's fun. It's new. Uh, it's cool. You know, I mean, what, what else do you got to say? It's it, it's weird. You know, so go for it. Uh, now, NFTs and all that stuff, I have a little bit of a different feeling. I have a bunch of artist friends that are stopping painting and stopping doing art and like shifting to NFTs. And I'm just like, wow, that that's wild. That To wrap your head around that, like it kind of freaks me out because I'm just like, man, the, our whole world is going to get digitized you know, and where does it end? Where does it end? I don't know. I'm, it gives me heartburn. But I will say I jumped on BitClout uh, recently, which you've heard of BitClout. On BitClout, the idea of uh, tokenizing your clout and allowing you personally to have your own coin is a really cool concept. I am a big fan of BitCloud. I think it's going to be, if you're listening to this, go get your uh, profile on BitCloud. Grab your name, secure it now, whether you use it or not, just do it. There's a lot of big heavy hitters that are jumping in on the BitCloud game and pumping, going to pump money into it. The same supporters that put money into Clubhouse. So Clubhouse blew up. I have a feeling BitClout is next. Wow, that that is really interesting. That's a that's kind of a fun place to end things. So, Cody, thanks so much for your time. This was awesome. So, a uh, reminder to listeners: you can learn more about Cody and his classes and everything he does at cleverinvestor.com, and definitely follow him on Instagram and YouTube. And a reminder: you can always email us at media at millionacres.com to share your thoughts and stay well and stay invested. Thank you for tuning in to the Million Acres Podcast. I hope you liked today's show. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing through your favorite podcast provider. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop us a line at help at millionacres.com. Stay well and stay invested. People on this program may have an interest in the deals, offerings, or services they discuss that Million Acres or The Motley Fool may have a formal recommendation for or against. Always consult a certified tax professional before acting on tax advice, and do not buy or sell assets based solely on what you hear. 